Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so what he's saying is that this branch is not reachable um, for whatever reasons. Um, we're going to figure out how we will um, symbolically figure this out um, and how we can use symbolic computation to find that this uh, branch is unreachable. So what is symbolic computation? Um, symbolic computation is about representing properties using mathematical equations. Um, and we use the solutions of these equations to reason about the properties we started with. Um, the property we wanted to know in the previous example is that uh, the reward is unreachable. And we have to figure out a way to convert this solidity code into a mathematical equation. And I want to give some hint about the climax, which is usually um, the, systems having, uh, the system of equation having a solution means that a property can be violated. And on the, other, on the contrary, um, if uh, the system of equations don't have any solution, then it usually means that the property is always true. I mean, this is not generally true, but most of the time, this is what you're trying to do. Um, and now we want to convert code into mathematical equations. How do we do that? So, um, so the question is, what do we encode? So we could encode solidity directly. Uh, we could encode Yule, which is an intermediate uh, representation of solidity. It's a one level down from solidity. We could also encode EVM, which is at the lowest level. So solidity is a complex language, and there's, let's maybe like skip encoding that because there's like too many rules we have to handle. Um, EVM, on the other hand, is like too simple, and we have to extract a lot of information about the control flow and encode it. So maybe let's ignore solidity and EVM for encoding and just deal with Yule. It's, it's, it's in the right middle ground. It's simple enough, and it has enough information about the control flow. So the most fundamental thing to encode would be a variable. And a variable in EVM is a 256-bit integer. Um, most of the time, you represent variables as an element of integers, um, z, uh, the notation. If possible, we add the constraint 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2 raised to 256 minus 1. Um, now that we know how to encode a very simple variable, we need to figure out how do we, how do we assign um, values to the variables. So here's a very simple Yule block with, with three variables, x, y, and z. x is assigned the value 1, y is assigned call data lot 0, and z is an expression in uh, Yule less than, or, less than x, y. So we want to represent each of these assignments by constraints. Um, uh, for x and y, it's pretty simple. Um, for x, you just have the equation x equal to 1. For y, we have to just say y. That's it. It's a simple EVM variable. We can't, we can't, we can't really like, produce any extra constraints from call data lot 0 because it can be anything. So we just have to treat y as a regular EVM variable. Um, and with z, we have to figure out a way to encode a less than of, of uh, x, y. Uh, we will deal with that later. Uh, but the big question is that, can we handle every assignment? So here is a different Yule block where you assign the value 1 to x, and there, there's a switch uh, statement which has uh, three different control flow uh, branches. So depending on the value of call data lot 0, which we don't know what it is, we can assign um, x, 2, 3, or 4. So the question is, can we actually encode um, the switch? Um, this brings us to the notion of a single static assignment. Um, so these are variables that are only assigned once. And working with SSA variables um, simplifies our analysis quite a bit. So here is an example of a different Yule block. You have two variables, x and y. y gets assigned called at load 32 at the beginning and then reassigned something else. Um, by definition, y is not an SSA variable. It's assigned twice. But it's actually possible to transform the same, um, transform this block into another Yule block where we introduce a new variable z, um, and all these variables are actually SSA variables. So generally speaking, we only want to work with SSA variables because they really simplify our analysis. 
Uh, however, it's not always possible to do a yule to yule transformation such that all the variables are SSA. Um, there was the example like two slides ago, uh, the, switch, uh, the, switch, uh, uh, the switch example. Uh, you cannot encode uh, X as an SSA variable purely in yule. But we can still get a lot done with just uh, taking whatever is SSA. And maybe we have, you know, we also have this step in the Yule optimizer called the SSA transform that lets us transform Yule into what we call as a pseudo SSA format. So a lot of variables are SSA, but it's uh, uh, it's not not it's not necessary that, that every variable is SSA. So whenever we encounter a non-SSA variable during the analysis, we would replace it by a free variable. So a free variable is what we mentioned like uh, two slides ago. Uh, sorry, three slides ago, which is just uh, the basic constraints that you can give uh, to any variable in, um, in the EVM. But there is this Im important caveat here that, OK, uh, whenever we encounter a non SSA variable, we have to replace it with a fresh variable, because the value may have been assigned something else uh, uh, during the two reads. But we can, of course, optimize this further, but this is what we'll do now. So now let's think about how do we encode some EVM instructions. Um, so perhaps the most fundamental EVM instruction is addition. Uh, you take two numbers and you, know, you add them and leave it at the stack. So how do we symbolically represent uh, the addition, you know, x, x plus y? Um, what do you think? It just, is it just x plus y? Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple. So if you look at the EVM semantics of addition, uh, addition is defined by x plus y modulo 2 raised to 2 over 6. And if you look at high-level solidity code, um, since 0, 8, 0, we have the checked arithmetic. So x plus y would reward if x plus y is greater than um, 2 raised to, greater than or equal to 2 raised to 2, 2 over 6. So we, we are already seeing that it's not as simple, it's not that simple to encode add. It's doable, but it's not the easiest. But Perhaps here is like an easier uh, set of instructions, um, less than, greater than, and E0. Here's a formal, rep formal like, um, representation of these opcodes. Um, we define when, when these values take 1 or 0. Um, there are like, if for less than or AB, if A is less than B, the value takes less, uh, the opcode gives 1. In the other case, it gives 0, uh, almost the opposite for greater than. Um, for is zero, if the value is zero, then you get one and zero otherwise. So let, let's um, digress for a bit and talk about difference logic. So let's start with an example. So x, y, and z are integer variables, and let there be constraints, two of them, x minus y less than or equal to four, and x minus z less than or equal to three. The question is, does the system have a solution? It does have a solution. You can just assign x equal to four, y equal to zero, z equal to one, and these two constraints are satisfied. So to, to, go, back, to go back a bit, you can generalize this um, difference logic by saying, OK, you can have n number of variables, x1 to xn, that are integers, and constraints of the form xi minus xj less than or equal to a constant. But let's look at a different example. You add one more constraint here, which is z minus x less than or equal to minus 8. And the question is, does this have a solution now? Any, any takers? It actually doesn't have a solution. And how do we prove this? So assume that there is a solution. Let's just add all the variables. So let's add, let's add all the equations. So you add x minus y plus y minus z plus z minus x. And the RHS is going to be 4 plus 3 minus 8. And the LHS is going to be 0. So we arrive at something 0 less than or equal to minus 1, which is a contradiction. So there is no solution. But how do we use? Uh, some graph theory trick to um, do the same thing. So we try to encode each of this constraint using a graph. Um, every variable is a node in this graph. So you can see that um, x, y, and z are three nodes. And we assign some weights. Um, these are the weights that come from uh, the equation. So x minus y is uh, less than or equal to 4. That would be the um, a weight of the edge, uh, similarly for the others. Um, what's important is that it's a direct graph, and um, the, the direction follows, you know. So in case of a minus b less than or equal to k, 
the edge is from B to A and has a weight of K. So the important takeaway here is that if there is a negative cycle uh, in our direct graph, then there are no solutions uh, to our problem. Um, you can see here, um, you can see here uh, there is a negative cycle. So if you add up um, 4 plus 3 plus minus A, that is negative 1. So that, that's what we are looking for. So how do we find uh, negative cycles in a graph? So there is this very classical algorithm called the Bellman Ford, uh, which can tell you, given a direct graph, um, is, there a, um, is there a negative cycle? You can also use it to find the shortest path between two, um, two nodes. That's the classical use case. But it can also tell you if there's a negative uh, cycle. And it's surprisingly easy to implement. You can even implement this in Solidity. Leo has a repo where he implements the Bellman Ford and much more in completely in Solidity. And he's going to have a talk tomorrow at 11, PM, 11 AM. Um, you can come for the talk for more details. And here is like some insight about unsatisfiability. Like unsatisfiability is when uh, the set of constraints have uh, no solutions. Um, and a lot of times, we only encode like a very small set of like uh, what we can actually encode, and we are very generous about like ignoring the constraints we can we can't solve. Like I said, already uh, we ignore like known SSA variables. Uh, so as long as we only care about unsatisfiability, we can do this, um, and we can optimize, and we can usually optimize when um, the constraints are unsatisfiable. Otherwise, we just uh, leave the code unchanged. Um, so we talked about difference logic, but what does it have to do with uh, all these like EVM um, opcodes? So it turns out that we can represent these three EVM opcodes using uh, expressions that would match uh, difference logic. So in case of less than of a b, so when the value is one, it's only when a minus b is less than or equal to minus one, and zero when b minus a less than or equal to zero. So similarly, you can uh, build these constraints uh, for greater than and is zero. So in the last example, um, zero is just a variable that we used to indicate as zero. There is some like nuance here, but you could just treat zero as a variable here. So how do we encode Yule? So a lot of times we want to know if the value of an expression is always zero or always non-zero. Um, so if you take this example of uh, if of condition and then uh, something going on in the if, if statement. Uh, we can replace, so the question we want to know is if we can replace condition by 0 or 1. Um, inside the branch, we can actually replace, we can add the additional constraint that condition equal to true. So to take a, um, in particular, if you look at less than, if of less than x, y, um, we start by checking if adding the constraint x less than y make the system unsatisfiable. So in, in difference logic, this is x minus y less than or equal to minus 1. We just add it to our other set of constraints. And if uh, the system is unsatisfiable, we can replace less than of x, y by 0. Um, similarly, we can check if the, system, if the constraint x greater than or equal to y make the system unsatisfiable. Um, in that case, we can replace less than of x, y by 1. And inside the if body, we can add the additional constraint that x, minus, x, le, x is less than y. In difference logic, that is x minus y less than or equal to minus 1. And then we can keep uh, doing our symbolic computation. So going back to the problem from the beginning, um, here is like a version of the same like solidity code in Yule. Uh, we have three variables, x, y, and z. They all read from call data. Uh, they are not 100% equivalent, but more or less, these are, this is how the Yule code would look like. And we have, three, um, we have three if statements. Um, the first one has less than of x, comma, y. The second one is less than of y, comma, z. And the third one has less than of z, comma, x. And the last one would revert if we can reach there. And the question we want to know is if the last less than of x, z can ever be 0. Sorry, it, it, can it ever be um, true? And if it's never true, we can replace it by if 0, which is what we want. Let's think about how to encode uh, the problem now. So we have three variables, x, y, z, that are integers. Uh, we don't have any extra conditions for call, call data log because it's, uh, we can't really tell anything about it. Um, we add a dummy variable, 0, as I said before. 
Now we add the constraints that uh, these variables are 256-bit numbers, that is 0 less than or equal to A less than or equal to the UN max. Um, so the first set of constraints are simply saying that x, is, x, y, and z are positive. You can see that. And the second one would say that um, x, y, and z are bounded by uh, the maximum value of uh, UN256. And inside the if branch, in the first branch, you can add the first uh, constraint, x minus y less than or equal to minus 1. Uh, inside the second if branch, we can add the constraint y minus z less than or equal to minus 1. The third one, we can add a similar one, z minus x less than or equal to minus 1. And we learn quite a bit here. So how do we represent all these constraints as a single graph? So you can see the nodes um, x, y, and z. You can also see the node 0. Uh, these are the constraints for the positivity and also the boundedness. So here m is uh, the, the maximum value of a 256-bit number. and um, Sorry. Um, this, this constraint is um, z minus x less than or equal to minus 1. Similarly, the others are uh, on the outer, I mean, the outer edges of the node. And the question we want to ask now is, is there a negative cycle in this graph? Uh, and turns out there is one. Um, the, the one uh, in, on the outside is a negative uh, cycle, uh, which means that um, the system has no solutions. Um, so now we can, we can actually replace this f of less than xz by f of 0. And once we have this f of 0, we can just completely remove this uh, branch. And um, after that, these branches are simply empty. You could actually remove the entirety of the code. Um, so in case of the difference logic, the solver is very simple. Um, as I said, you can write it in solidity, layers and that. Um, however, in general, the solver can get quite complex, and the question of correctness will always come up. Um, the biggest priority for solidity is like the correctness of the compiler, and we really want to like, minimize um, ex trusting external tools uh, as much as possible when uh, they influence uh, the code generated. So, so in case of a symbolic solver, if there's a way to verify that, uh, that the result is indeed true, then that is very good for us. So in case of a difference logic, you can ask, is it possible to produce a proof that the system is indeed uh, unsatisfiable, that there are no solutions? Uh, turns out you can actually do that. Uh, the proof of unsatisfiability in this case would be uh, just giving a set of constraints where the, if you add up the left-hand side, it's going to be 0. If you add up the right-hand side, it's going to be a negative number. So you get 0 less than or equal to minus 1, which is a contradiction. And uh, the solver can just tell you that, oh, these are the constraints that would add up to uh, um, 0 on the left and a negative number on the right. Um, and this can be verified by you know, whatever tool that is going to use the result of the solver. But in general, you can, you can get proofs for a lot of um, symbolic um, logic. Um, symbol I mean, you can get proofs from a lot of symbolic solvers. But it's not always possible. Um, I mean, maybe the example was like very simple, like who cares about those three um, if branches? But look, let's look at a more real-world example where this could be actually useful. Um, as a lot of times, users would like to add their own uh, text before compiler checks. So here is an array that um, you just read from the array, and you read from other, one of the index. Um, and um, and the user wants to check if the, the index is going to be greater than or equal to array of length, which means there is an out-of-bounds access. And the user wants to like revert uh, by um, this customer error. Uh, however, the compiler will automatically do this um, check when, I mean, in this code. So doing this, is, doing this check manually is actually like wasting gas and is redundant. Uh, but this is like a good pattern. Like so sometimes users want to like reward with their own error messages. But we can actually use different logic to see that the second, um, um, the second like constraint. I mean, once you get out of this uh, if branch, you can add the constraint that uh, the index is less than uh, less than array of length, 
uh, because uh, this branch is always terminating. Like, if you get into this branch, it's going to revert. But in general, it can also be a, a, return, a branch where it's always going to re return. Um, so we can actually add this extra constraint. So, and if you have this check once again, you can actually prove that this uh, check is going to be unreachable, and then you can optimize out those branch. So how do we improve? Um, yeah, how do we, where do we go from the dif difference logic? So we could only encode less than, greater than, and a zero. Uh, but once we graduate from the constraints of the form x, x less than or equal to y less than or equal to k, sorry, x minus k, x minus y less than or equal to k, we can think about generalizing this. So one generalization would be constraints of the form a1x plus a2x until a, a n x n less than or equal to b, um, where a i and a i and b are constants and x i is a symbolic uh, variable and integers. Uh, we can actually solve that using um, what's called like linear programs and the simplex method. And once you can do that, you can encode addition and subtractions uh, because addition would be like x1 plus x2 um, and subtraction would be x1 minus x2. They would uh, satisfy that, that like form. Um, but there are some nuances here because um, addition in EVM um, has a wrapping behavior. So you have to have some kind of branching to deal with this modulo, um, modulo but it's doable. Um, we can also encode multiplication and division uh, similarly, where one of, the, um, one of them has to be a constant uh, and the other one can be symbolic. In case of division, the, the, the second one has to be uh, uh, constant. In, in case, case of multiplication, you can any, anything, uh, one of the variables has to be symbolic and the other one uh, constant. Yeah, I think that, that's it from, uh, for my talk. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, we have some time for questions, so please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I see a hand over there um, in the back. A volunteer is coming to you with the mic. One second. Oh, and another one there. Stand up. Nice. Oh, and another one there, yeah. Hey, um, I'm wondering how do you know as a Solidity developer when your checks are redundant and what can you do to inspect that? Yeah, I think the only way to do that would be perhaps uh, um, do both the tests. I mean, write uh, both of them and see if they have the same gas or uh, check the um, yeah check the intermediate representation perhaps or or the assembly and make a diff. Um, I mean, none of the things I mentioned here are implemented so far. There are some branches. Uh, these are just mostly experimental uh, features. Sorry, what? Yeah, but it's not moist. Maybe just to use it as a segue, which parts are already implemented and what else might we see in the future? Um, so we have an experimental uh, solver that uses an SMT checker, um, an experimental optimization stage already. It's called a reasoning-based simplifier. Um, it uses the full power of an SMT solver. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's disabled by default in the compiler, but you can probably enable it if you specify uh, the optimization sequence that includes uh, this one step. Um, so you can still get some of this if you add an extra, um, an extra like, um, letter to the optimization sequence. Uh, but the rest of, so the whole point of the talk is you can build a very simple logic that can do a small subset of computations. This is not done. Uh, this is not in the, the master yet. Um, but most of the SSA transform, it's already there. <laughs> no idea. I, I thought I saw a third question somewhere. Please raise your hand if, if you have one. If not, a big round of applause for Harry. Thank you. We got one more, one more question. Oh, one more. OK, one more. Last one. Um, so you said we should be uh, doing this optimization on UL rather than uh, EVM bytecode or Solidity, or, or it, it's more conducive. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, it's, it seems like people would use this sort of uh, use this sort of analysis to potentially like look at MEV constraints um, and 
I'm wondering how you could apply this to on-chain bytecode or uh, if that's uh, infeasible. Yeah, you can probably like um, decompile um, EVM into maybe some Yule and try to do similar analysis on it. Um, there is this tool that's getting built by uh, Leo and some other people called Yules. You can probably check the status of that. It can do some of this uh, symbolic computation. It doesn't, I mean, it uses like the full power of SMT solvers. That, not this restricted version, but you can you can probably check it out. So once you have a translator from um, EVM to Yule, um, you can apply these tools, or you can use SEVM, which works on um, EVM bytecode directly. Um, another possibility. Awesome! Thank you so much, Hari. I hope your brains got kind of preheated throughout the last two talks because now we are going even deeper. Um, we can, I guess, already use the time while I announce the next speaker to set up because this will be more of a workshop setup. Zina, maybe you want to come up uh, on the stage already to, to set your infrastructure up. Um, the next speaker we will have here is Zina. He's part of the Go Ethereum team and in the team his focus today is mostly on tracing, the JSON RPC and the GraphQL APIs. And today he'll be talking about EVM tracing in Geth. Um, yeah, brace yourselves for a very detailed download on basic tracing, commonly faced problems, as well as an introduction to the more recently shipped features and how to write efficient tracers. Welcome Zina, big applause.